All right, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. So I'm going to give a last shout out. What is today? Thursday? Yeah. So last shout out for the lecture capture survey. Um, it'll be taken down on Friday, so please give me your feedback there. And then I'm going to start nagging around your course evaluation. So I think that they're up and uh, ready for you to fill out. Um, Course evaluations are a really critical component of the feedback in um, continuing to develop any course, and that is particularly important in this course. So uh, what we try to do is try to get at least 50% of students giving, uh, evaluate, or giving feedback on the course evaluations, um, because then what you're telling me, I can then actually implement knowing that at least half the class saw this as a problem or saw something as an issue, right? If only 10% respond and somebody wants something changed, it's really hard for me to implement that because I don't know whether that was like a majority, a majority idea or a majority thought. So the course does change based on the course evaluations every year. So last year I asked in particular for feedback on the um, problem solving sessions. And so I got a real, lot of really good feedback on how effective or ineffective the problem solving sessions were. So the problem solving sessions changed for you guys based on that. And, even, and one, one extra was added because the class had requested that we do more problem solving sessions. So um, one extra was, um, was added for you guys. So I would uh, really appreciate feedback uh, for your course evaluations, regardless of what you want to tell me, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I need your feedback. Uh, and in particular, if you could give me comments on um, the problem solving sessions, because those will continue to evolve. And I need uh, and want your input on how to evolve those, because those are those problem solving sessions. I have certain motivations for doing those. And from what I can see on midterms and what goes on during the problem solving sessions, my um, boxes are checked in terms of what I wanted out of those for you guys, but I need to know from you guys whether you, uh, what you got out of them or whether you thought they were effective or ineffective or helpful or how they might change based on what your experience was, okay? Um, so your feedback is critical. It's especially critical in courses like this that have um, TA support. So of course, this course, any physiology course, could be offered by Prof standing up and spewing facts and giving you a multiple choice test, and then we'd all be done, right? Any course can be offered that way. Um, but courses that aren't offered that way, like Human Phys 1 and Phys 2, we offer it in a different way. We want you to think about physiology different, but it needs TA support, right? So in order for us to lobby for TA support for the activities that we do in Human Phys 1 and Human Phys 2, we need to know from or need to be able to prove that the course is effective and your course evaluation, the course of your feedback on course evaluations are critical in us being able to say, look, our course is effective, so could we please continue with the TA support versus if you give me feedback and say, nah, it wasn't effective at all, then we need to change it and maybe, and, and then the course structure will be completely changed. Okay, so Human Phys 1 and Phys 2, they are two courses that require five TAs. So that's, uh, you know, the ask there is close to like $30,000 to run these two courses, right? So that's why we need feedback to try to maintain them because they're expensive courses to run. We want to maintain them because we think they're effective, but really critically, we need to know from y'all whether you think they, think they're effective. So I, if you could give feedback to say, Yes, they're effective, that's awesome. No, they're not effective, that's awesome, okay? So I don't care what the feedback is, we just need feedback. 10% of the class writes in and says, nah, it's not effective, um, we don't know where to go with that. If 50% of the class writes in and says it's not effective, then we, need, then we know what we need to do in order to change it to make it better, okay? So course evaluations are not a trivial exercise. Okay, you might think, oh, I give opinions and they go nowhere. They absolutely go places, okay? And courses are, course design is built on them, okay? So 
that's my first shout out for course evaluations. But I will nag you again, no doubt. Okay, so let's get back into the course material. So we started goofing around with the regulation of hydrogen ion. And we started to think about how we were going to regulate. We, we, we laid the problem out in terms of how sensitive we are to hydrogen ion, how sensitive we were in the nanomolar range, and how much we made the millimolar range. So we've got this colossal task now of trying to manage in the nanomolar range while we create in the millimolar range, okay? So then we started to lay out how, what do we have available to handle that? Okay, so we talked about this buffer system um, that's available or that we have laid in, three major buffers, uh, proteins, phosphates, and bicarb. Um, and of course, bicarb, because of the amount that we have being one of the major buffer systems in the body, okay? So buffer systems are great. They can um, hide the problem to minimize the disturbance, right? But they can't get rid of a problem, right? Because if you've got a hydrogen ion problem, remember it's free hydrogen ion that's regulated. If you've got a hydrogen ion problem, what we can do to, so that it doesn't hurt you is scoop it up and bind to something where it's not going to change its function, so that's what buffers are for. Scoop it up and hide it, but it's still in the body, right? So it's still a body problem. We just changed its form to kind of hide it a little bit so it doesn't do any damage. But at the end of the day, if you have a hydrogen ion problem, in order to fix it, you got to get rid of the hydrogen ion, okay? You got to get rid of it out of the body in order for the problem to go away. Buffers can't do that, right? Buffers are going to bind hydrogen ion to hide it, to minimize any disturbance while we wait for other systems to come online to actually be able to get rid of that problem, okay? So absolutely critical, but they're not fixing our problem for us. So we got buffers. And then our next line of defense are our lungs. here. So buffers are going to work on a milliseconds to seconds time scale, so we're going to start to think about time here a little bit. The second line of defense will be our lungs or respiration at the level of the lung. Um, we can help with a hydrogen ion problem using our lungs on a uh, minutes to hours time scale, right? So we can't change hydrogen ion based on our lungs on a millisecond scale. That's what we have buffers for. Here we can handle issues on a minutes to hours time scale. Okay, so uh, we've started to see this already at the level of the lung. We can change CO2, therefore we can change hydrogen ion. We know how they're related already, right? So at the lung, if we change ventilation, okay, so we were doing that on Tuesday. If we can change ventilation, we can change CO2 and CO2 and hydrogen ion were related through the carbonic and high, or sorry, through the uh, carbonic acid relationship, okay, where we were able to, if we were to decrease CO2, we would pull the equation in this direction and that would hide hydrogen ion in the form of water. Okay, so we so lungs still can't fix the problem, right? It can take this hydrogen ion, convert it to uh, water or hide it in the form of water, and then we can handle the CO2, but the hydrogen ion is still in the body, so it's still not a fix, but it's a really good hide because we can handle water. We can't handle the free hydrogen ion, so it's a really good hide. 
if we didn't have enough hydrogen ion, an increase in CO2 would push the equation in the opposite direction to liberate hydrogen ion from water, A, and we would then create uh, uh, a bicarb ion and hydrogen ion, okay? So at the end of the day, if I write that out in words, what the lungs can do is eliminate CO2 and convert hydrogen ion uh, in the form of, uh, into the form of water. So we can get rid of, out of the body, part of the issue, but not the whole issue. And converts hydrogen ion or you know, converts or binds hydrogen ion in uh, in the form of water. Okay, so we kind of hit it a little bit. It's a short-term and temporary solution. Right, because we can't change respiration um, too much because respiration, uh, while we're trying to change CO2, will also change oxygen. Okay, so we can't mess with it too much or too long, okay, because, um, because of the other gases that it's going to mess with. So it, it really is a short term or a temporary fix. Okay, so again, this is a maneuver for the body to minimize the disturbance. Okay. okay, and that is because remember that the lung also regulates oxygen. So it's powerful, but it has limits to how we can use it. Okay, and our third regulator then is something that can actually fix the problem, and that's the level of the kidney. So this is the kidney, though, because of how it's going to fix a problem, takes a little bit longer. So it's going to be something that can start to fix the problem on an hours to days time scale. Okay. So as soon as you see that we can actually fix a problem on an hours or days time scale, you can then see why we have so many other things that just minimize the disturbance on shorter time scales. All right? If we have to wait for hours to days for our body to be able to fix something, we had better have things on a milliseconds to seconds and a seconds to minutes time scale to help us manage it. Why we, l why we wait for the system to can actually fix it to get up regulated. So that's why we have two lines of defense that look like we're just minimizing or hiding the problem. So it's a brilliant approach, right, because we have to hide the problem because the thing that can actually fix the problem is going to take longer. Okay, and we'll see why it takes a little bit longer for the kidney to get up regulated to help. Um, but critical then, because it's taking hours to days, to do that, we have to hide the problem until until that time period. Yep. Yeah. So hiding the would the question was would hiding the problem then not let the kidney get up regulated, right? To fix that, you're absolutely right. What you're looking for is well, we got to have a signal. The kidney has to sense a problem, and we have to be able to. Um, then upregulate, right? Absolutely. So minimizing a disturbance is exactly what it's doing. It's not eliminating it, right? So when you have a hydrogen ion problem and that free hydrogen ion is going from like 40 nanomolar to 50 nanomolar to 60 nanomolar, right? We're starting to get ourselves into huge trouble. Hiding the problem will take us maybe back down to 50 or 45. You're not, we're not going to eliminate it. So there will all, the problem will always exist 
It's the magnitude of the problem that buffers and the lung will help us minimize that for a little bit until the kidney gets upregulated. But it's a, re it's a really important observation that we can't hide it completely or else the kidney has no idea that there's a problem. Something has to sense a problem, right? The kidney's not gonna do anything unless it knows there's an issue. So indeed, the issue will always be present, it's, uh, but the lungs and our buffers just aren't gonna let the problem get to the point of um, where we might damage ourselves. And remember, the point of damaging ourselves is pretty, uh, is pretty slim, right? Going from 40 nanomolar to 100 nanomolar, we're gonna start causing some pretty major damage. So we, we just won't go down that road because we have these two lines of defense ahead. But we do, uh, the problem still exists and the kidney will sense that. So that's an excellent point. Okay, so we're at the kidney, something that can actually fix the problem. So this is a very powerful regulator. And this is due to its ability to, ability to actually excrete hydrogen ion and bicarb from the body. So when we were looking at the kidney, we did see, we didn't discuss them in depth because we're gonna discuss them in depth now, we did see mechanisms along the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct where you could actually move, you had, you had symporters and antiporters and, and uh, ATPases that were moving hydrogen ion and bicarb, okay? So the kidney can actually, if we can get hydrogen ion in the lumen of the tubule, we can get it out, okay? If we can get bicarb into that lumen of the tubule and trap it there, we can excrete it out. So that's why it's a, a much more powerful regulator. And because it can move it out of the body and not just hide it, we can actually fix a problem from here. So the we're gonna be looking to the kidney to actually fix for us. So we're gonna spend a little bit, of, we've, we know an awful lot about what's happening at the level of the lung. Okay, because we've just come off that and we will circle back to this in a bit. Let's, I wanna refocus us back at the level of the kidney to focus in on those bicarb and hydrogen ion moving cells, right? Just to reorient ourselves there. So the kidney has, when it comes to a hydrogen ion and a bicarb problem, the kidney has two tasks. First of all, because, remember, because the kidney, the philosophy of the kidney was to filter everything and then bring back what we wanted, we filtered a lot of bicarb. So the kidney has to get back that bicarb. So first of all, just to remain constant, the kidney has to have systems to reabsorb all of the filtered bicarb. So that's thing one that it's gotta do. And then the other thing that it has the ability to do is, um, imbalance that, right? So if we bring back equal amounts of bicarb and hydrogen ion, then our pH will remain constant. But if we can now um, unbalance those or disconnect those in a way that I, de and I, I reabsorb more bicarb and I excrete some hydrogen ion, we will now have more bicarb in the body and our pH will go up, okay? Because now we have more buffering capacity or vice versa, if we, want, if we need more free hydrogen ion, then we uncouple them at the level of the kidney and we reabsorb more hydrogen ion and um, excrete bicarb, trap it in the tubule. So we uncouple them. So if I'm excreting more bicarb, reabsorbing more hydrogen ion, I have more free hydrogen ion in the body, my pH goes down, okay? So the, first of all, we need to look at how the kidney is getting back its normal base and then how it's going to uncouple them, okay? So we're gonna look at kind of two processes. So the kidney must first uh, reabsorb f the filtered bicarb.
and then it's got to excrete hydrogen ion or bicarb from the body. Basically uncouple the two. The minute we can uncouple the two is the minute we can start to fix the problem. Okay. So sometimes it's a little hard to see how the kidney is doing both of those things individually because they're using the same tools to do both of those things simultaneously. Okay, so that's why we're gonna just spend a little time on thinking a little bit about what the kidney normally does and then how the kidney might uncouple them, okay? Because it will use similar tools. All right, so let's, I have brought some kidney cells forward. Okay, so I have taken some of our cells from the level of the kidney, like the, uh, like the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb and the collecting duct, and I've just brought forward the cells that deal with hydrogen ion and bicarb, right? So we know that these cells exist in that nephron like all of our other cells did. Um, in terms of, especially like in the proximal tubule, this was just some of the mechanisms out of a whole bunch of mechanisms that brought filtered stuff back into the body. Okay, so uh, like in our other discussions, I have, let's say I've got the lumen of the tubule, so let's say I'm in the proximal tubule, and this is a discussion, first of all, let's make sure we're clear here, that um, here we're talking about uh, the ability to reabsorb filtered bicarb. Okay, so how is the kidney doing that? So at the level of the proximal tubule and the ascending, uh, thick ascending limb, we have uh, bicarb and hydrogen ion that have been filtered, right? So we were at the Bowman's capsule, we had bicarb and hydrogen ion filtered, and now we're looking to get back the things that we need. Okay, so the process of getting it back is not to necessarily move or have transporters for each of these to bring them in and across, kind of like that was the approach for glucose, right? We put a transporter over here and we bring glucose into sodium and then facilitate a diffusion on the other side and we were good to go. Okay, that's not quite the process here. Hydrogen ion and uh, bicarb form carbonic acid and then dissociate with the help of carbonic anhydrase to form CO2 and water, okay? Now remember, like, so CO2 is now going to be able to diffuse across membranes like they're not there. It's lipid soluble. So now we need no transporter for it. Okay? And, and water is able to move. Um, remember, we had things like solvent drag and things like that. So water is moving fairly freely. So we are able to bring the CO2 and the water into cells pretty readily. Right? And, it, uh, and the CO2 especially will equilibrate pretty quickly across compartments. So once we have CO2 and water in the cell, we can build it back up to hydrogen ion and bicarb. Okay, so these get um, converted to the carbonic acid with carbonic anhydrase and we build, or, and then we disassociate into hydrogen ion and bicarb. So essentially we took this bicarb and hydrogen ion and have now been able to move it into the cell, okay? And then we set the cell up in an, asymmetrical, in an asymmetric way to be able to move the bicarb over to the interstitial space. Okay, there's some antiporters, there's some symporters, and then we know that we can reabsorb once we get it into that interstitial space. Now the reason I think for this strange process of getting hydrogen ion and bicarb back is because we, are tr we have filtered 24 millimolar bicarb, right? Remember that's how much we had. So we filtered up to millimolars, millimolar quantities of bicarb. And in order to get it back, we have nanomolar quantities of hydrogen ion. So we have to have hydrogen ion antiporters on the luminal side of the cell to keep spitting that hydrogen ion back out, recycle it, bind to another bicarb, put it into carbonic acid, dissociate it into water, and then move those both across. Okay, so we need a very, very, we need, a, we need hydrogen ion to bring it back. We need hydrogen ion to get bicarb back. 
but we have na nanomolar hydrogen ion, free hydrogen ion, to bring back millimolar bicarb. So we need to continue to recycle that, that free hydrogen ion. So if you look at this, what this free hydrogen ion is doing, this free hydrogen ion is just cycling, 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 cycling. It has to, we have nanomolar free hydrogen ion to bring back millimolar bicarb, okay? So we do have to reuse and reuse and reuse this hydrogen ion while we take bicarb and put it on the other side. Okay, so this is the process of just getting the filtered bicarb back. All right, so this is the process that we need to go through just to remain stable. Okay. Now, if we had a problem, we needed to fix it, then we need to kind of dissociate. We have to um, I, uh, take those out of balance. We have to either put out more hydrogen ion than bicarb resorbed, or put out more bicarb and resorb more hydrogen ion, right? So we have to, we have to take that balance. So we do have cells in the collecting duct that will help us do that, okay? So um, in terms of our second process, so we can reabsorb the filtered stuff. And then when we're thinking about processes, they're gonna help us with secreting or reabsorbing hydrogen ion or bicarb, we have um, special cells in the collecting duct. We have principal cells and intercalated cells, right? Those principal cells were the ones that were, that were responsive to ADH and we could change the permeability of water using principal cells. There was another cell type laid in there, these intercalated cells. and there are two types of intercalated cells. A cell that looks like it's set up in its asymmetry, it's set up to reabsorb bicarb. And a cell that looks like, in fact, it looks like it's just flipped because now it secretes bicarb. So the cell that reabsorbs bicarb okay, is set up in a way to be able to bring in bicarb and hydrogen ion in the form of CO2 and water. We build it back up and now the cell is uh, structured a little bit differently. It has lots of things on the luminal side of the cell to deal with putting hydrogen ion back into the lumen of the tubule. Okay, so it does have antiporters and it actually has some pumps here. That's a hydrogen ion ATPase, so we are serious about pumping hydrogen ion out. And then on the interstitial space side, mechanisms to bring bicarb back. Okay, so the cell is set up a little more asymmetrically here to put hydrogen ion on one side and bicarb on the other. Okay. And then in essence, if you take this cell you flip it, you can create a cell where you excrete uh, or secrete bicarb and reabsorb hydrogen ion, right? So we will have cells that do the opposite. You can bring in hydrogen ion and CO2 uh, and uh, bicarb in the form of CO2 and water, like we talked about, and then on the interstitial space side, have um, antiporters to put that bicarb that you made back out into the lumen of the tubule, hopefully to excrete it. And on the interstitial space side, pumps to move hydrogen ion in from the cell into the interstitial space. Okay, so we have this capacity then. You can see where if we could upregulate one of these two cells, we would have the ability to put hydrogen ion out into the lumen of the tubule, hopefully lose it uh, or excrete it, and then put bicarb back into the body and vice versa, okay? So we have some tools. 
So based on those tools, though, we do need a little bit of help. So we have to make sure. So there's two, there's two ways, really, of having, uh, of working with, or, or having bicarbohydrogen, these tools actually work for us. We can have um, a net gain of bicarb on one side or hydrogen ion on one side. Then we also have some tools to actually make bicarb new, okay? So there's, we have one more set of tools down here to be able to form new bicarb, okay? So if we think about the formation of new bicarb, we do have down at the level of the uh, proximal tubule and the collecting duct, we have an enzyme that will break down glutamine into ammonium and bicarb, okay? So we've got an enzyme here got this enzymatic reaction that's going to take uh, substrate, glutamine, and bust it into ammonium and two bicarb. Okay, so we've got that happening in the cell. So if we want to form new bicarb, then we make sure that once we've split it into ammonium and bicarb, that we then build the cell in such a way that uh, we get bicarb back on the interstitial space side and that we put that ammonium out onto the luminal side, okay? Uh, so we actually make two ammonium just to make that uh, equation balance. So we can move that ammonium out through antiporters right out into the uh, collecting duct, or sorry, right out into the lumen of the tubule. So that's awesome. Then the cool thing is, is if we can get it into the form of ammonium in the uh, lumen of the tubule, we have no way to get ammonium back. So NH4, we have no way to get it back. So once we can get it into that form, we are good to go. It's as good as gone. Okay, because we have no way, we have no way to get ammonium back. Okay, so that's a great way to take, to disassociate the two, right? I'm going to make uh, a base and make an acid based on an enzy enzymatic reaction. I'm going to make sure the acid gets trapped out onto the luminal side and the base, the buffer, goes back into the interstitial space side, right? So I'm disassoci I've disassociated the two. And if I can get this out of the body, then what I've done is I, ha is I have the formation of new bicarb. With that, if we can't get that acid out of the body, it isn't considered formation of new bicarb because we created a base, we created some acid, we have no net gain, right? If you want net gain, you've got to dissociate the two. You've got to get the acid out and the buffer back in the body. That's how you get new bicarb, right? So we have this ability to form it new, but we've got to get rid of that. We've got to get rid of the acid that we made. So we can do that by shuttling it right out, but this will dissociate very quickly into um, ammonia. And hydrogen ion, okay, so now you can actually see that we've made buffer and hydrogen ion based on this enzymatic reaction, right? And so we've got to get Got to get it out. Okay, so um, the ammonia can move out into the uh, lumen of the tubule. We have antiporters to get the hydrogen ion out. And then hopefully they bind to make ammonium. As soon as they make ammonium, we have no way to get it back. So we've trapped that hydrogen ion in the form of ammonium, and then we have no way to get it back into the body, okay? So the, and then once that hydrogen is out, we actually have formation of new bicarb. 
if we kept that hydrogen ion in the body, this is critical for the next piece, if I move hydrogen ion into the body and the bicarb into the body, there is no net gain of bicarb because I made a hydrogen ion that's going to bind to it. So there's no net gain. So we've got to separate the two. So here, awesome way to separate the two. This is called ionic capture. Nothing really fancy other than we have found a way to trap hydrogen ion out in the lumen of the tubule that doesn't require having it bound to buffer. Okay, so we trapped it in something else and got rid of it. So that's considered new. So indeed, when we're talking about the formation of new uh, bicarb, we have the enzymatic mechanism to create new. But then, if at any point I can disassociate the hydrogen ion from the bicarb, put the bicarb in the body and put the hydrogen ion in the lumen of the tubule and trap it and get it out, I will have essentially have a net gain of bicarb. So you can have a net gain. You can have something that looks like it's the formation of new, but it was really just a net gain. <coughs> okay, so a couple of processes here. We can create it new from glutamine, but then we can do the net gain game, which is if I have hydrogen ion and bicarb in my cell, and then I can chuck out a, I can chuck out my hydrogen ion into the uh, lumen of the tubule, and we have plenty of ways to do that on the luminal side, and uh, and then on the interstitial space side, move bicarb out. If I can trap this hydrogen ion in here with something and let it go, then this is considered a net gain. If that hydrogen ion manages to not bind and it sneaks its way back, there was no net gain. Okay, we are just on that equal playing field again. So we can do things like there are buffers that will be in, uh, we do filter some proteins, there will be some phosphate here. So we do have some other non-bicarb buffers that, we, that will be out in uh, the lumen of the tubule that if we can bind it to hydrogen ion and excrete it out in that bound form. We will have a net gain of bicarb because we dissociated the two. Okay, so there are situations where we've got a, we look like we have new bicarb because we made new, or we look like we have new bicarb because we dissociated the two processes and we have a net gain. Okay, so a couple of ways to get new bicarb in the system. So. Uh, what's this? Oh, this process. Ionic capture was happening at the level of the proximal tubule. Okay, at the level of the collecting duct. If we do have ammonia out at the level of the collecting duct, we do have cells here that can move or antiporters for sodium and hydrogen ion. And if we can put hydrogen ion out into the lumen of the tubule, and put bicarb, this is a chloride transporter, put bicarb into the interstitial space and move it into the bloodstream. This, again, is the same process as the one I just mentioned. We managed to trap hydrogen ion with something other than our bicarb buffer in the lumen of the tubule, right? So that would be trap it in that form of um, ammonium and then it'll head out of the body. If I can get it out of the body while bringing back the bicarb, that's considered a net gain. Okay, so we have ways of tipping the balance. We have ways of getting back what we filter, which requires a lot of hydrogen ion recycling. 
and then we can tip the scales. So at the end of the day then, how do we control these cells to tip the scales, right? That's what we need to know in order to know how the uh, body is gonna handle or help us fix a hydrogen ion problem, okay? So how do we tip the scales? So let's think about in terms of those uh, processes that we just talked about in the proximal tubule and the collecting duct, how do we regulate those? Okay, so how are we gonna regulate those transporters? How are we gonna regulate that enzyme? That's what we're gonna be focusing on, right? So interesting, nothing too, too complicated here. Acidification of the intracellular environment of those cells will cause transporters numbers to go to change and will cause that enzyme to change its behavior okay so if we make the inside of those cells of the distal to of the proximal tubule and the collecting duct more acid then we're going to upregulate certain systems if we make it more basic right so alkalization of the intracellular environment will cause the exact opposite thing to happen okay so it seems to be the presence of CO2 or hydrogen ion on the inside of those cells that's gonna change their behavior. So acidification of the intracellular environment. Okay, and I can get that by increasing CO2, right? If CO, increasing CO2 shows up in the lumen of the tubule, then we're gonna have an increase in um, uh, acid, uh, CO2 in the cells, and we're gonna combine that with water and make an increase in hydrogen ion on the inside of those cells, okay? So we can do that with CO2, but we can also do it with, if we have a hydrogen ion problem, okay? A direct increase in hydrogen ion there. And so what this acidification will do is uh, stimulate bicarb reabsorption and enhance the, sec the uh, secretion of hydrogen ion. So we're going to stimulate bicarb reabsorption. And enhance hydrogen ion secretion. By actually changing the number of transporters and ATPases. Okay, so those transporters on the luminal side that were helping us with getting rid of uh, hydrogen ion and the transporters on the interstitial space side that were helping us with reabsorbing bicarb, we are gonna increase their numbers, okay? This is why it takes a little time to get the system up regulated. Okay, we have to make new proteins. Right, so, the, so what it seems to be happening is, is that acidification of the inside of the cell is going to change transcription and translation, right, of certain proteins, and then we take those proteins and we stick them in the sides of the cell where they're appropriate, and we get more hydrogen ion excretion and more bicarb reabsorption, right? This is why it takes hours to days, because we actually have to make new proteins. We don't have them sitting on board just waiting. So because we're gonna make new proteins, that's gonna take a bit of time. Um, and what else it does, it's gonna increase the amount of enzyme. That we have, um, which breaks down our glutamine. and this will help us with increase, uh, an increase in new, formation of new bicarb. But again, because the, uh, um, because the 
process is about making more enzymes, right? We've got to go in and make a protein. So it's going to take hours to base to do that. Um, so the opposite then will occur with alkalization of the intracellular space. So the exact opposite is going to occur. I can't even say that word. Hang on. Intra. Ur. No, I can't do it. Oh, there's an I missing. I get it. Okay. Alkalization of the intracellular air space. Okay. So, how do we do that? Alkalization, if we drop the amount of CO2 that we have. Um, we will drop the amount of hydrogen ion that we have, okay? And if we actually physically go in and decrease hydrogen ion, that'll do the same thing. So the alkalization now of the uh, intracellular space is going to stimulate the secretion of bicarb. Okay, so all of those transporters that actually were on the inter on the luminal side are now going to be upregulated, right? So this is a different set of transporters, different set of proteins now. Okay, stimulate the secretion of bicarb and enhance the reabsorption of hydrogen ion. change in the transporters, and ATP is this. Okay, so while you're studying, I want you to take a little moment to go back and look at the cells that we just looked at, okay, the, the cells that I brought forward, and look at what puts bicarb into the, or into the luminal space, because those are going to be the transporters that are increased during alkalization. Okay, and then I want you to look at what transporters uh, and ATPases are on the interstitial space side of the cell for hydrogen ion that are going to move hydrogen ion into the interstitial space because those are the transporters that are increased during an alkalization. Okay? The same is true for looking at the cells during acidification. Okay? So just make sure you take a look at what those tr uh, what those transporters are. Uh, okay, and then we're going to do the opposite to uh, our enzyme. We're going to decrease the amount. And increase or decrease the amount of enzyme that breaks down glutamine. which will decrease the formation of new bicarb. Okay, so pretty straightforward mechanisms for, we don't, we're not hooking up some sort of sensor that goes to the coordinating center that comes down and changes the vectors, right, which was our kind of normal route. Here we seem to have a direct route. If we have acidification going on, boom, the kidney senses that and changes it right away. Okay, so we kind of eliminate it. There's got to be a chemo sensor down there somewhere. Something has to be sensing this change in hydrogen ions. But it doesn't seem to be take the same type of route that our classic negative, uh, our classic negative feedback route was built on. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll get back to trying to figure out how we're going to get cells to actually help us with an acid or a base problem. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to the 
wild world of acid-base regulation because hydrogen ions are about to fly here. So we'll just, uh, I'm just going to go over a little bit of um, language that you might come across at the end of the day. What was the kidney doing for us? We were recapturing filtered. Uh, there's one missing filtered bicarb. Okay, and remember we had to do that to the tune of 24 millimolar to make sure that we keep 24 millimolar bicarb in the body. Okay, so that's called our, you'll see that called buffer base. That's what your buffer base is. So the buffer base is, all, is often considered that 24 millimolar bicarb, but we do know that we have other buffers in there. We had proteins and we have um, the phosphate buffers, right? So there is a difference between when people talk about buffer base or when you see it written, buffer base is, is uh, related to the bicarb. Total buffer base. is the entire suite of buffers that we have available to us, uh, which is about 32 millimolar. So just be careful when you see the word buffer base, <coughs> what they're talking about. Make sure they're not talking about total. Okay, so there is a little bit of a language issue there. Um, what else is the kidney doing for us? So the kidney could excrete bicarb. Okay, so we saw there were ways to get a nut. A net loss of bicarb. Okay, this is going to be called a base deficit. So remember that net loss of bicarb, it has to be out of the body. It's, that's critical. We're not just hiding it somewhere. This will be referred to as a base deficit. isn't right. Defies. No, that's not right. Def. Def. Uh, deficit. Okay, so we'll say that the Thursday spelling of deficit is with two eyes. Def that doesn't even look right. Deficit. You know, like when you look at a word too long, it's like that nothing's right. So, less bicarb. We'll go with that as our Thursday spelling. Um, and then we can also make new bicarb. Or that net gain. Right where we will then have more than 24 millimolar. <coughs> in the body, and they'll call this a base excess. Okay, so you will see written <coughs> base deficit, which means you've gone below the 24 millimolar, right? You no longer have the base. Or base excess, we have above the base, above the 24 millimolar, okay? So those are words that are gonna come flying at you in a minute. Okay, so now, I'm going to introduce some tools, and these tools are going to be a little more, uh, they're going to seem more complicated than they should be, but the problem with trying to solve acid-base problems is you're trying to keep track of three variables that are changing at the same time. You're trying to keep track of CO2, hydrogen ion, and bicarb. Okay, so these tools are developed in order to try to keep track of those three. And in fact, it's so difficult for, um, at the clinician level, that there have been whole approaches to try to give MDs tools to try to help them assess a patient who comes in with some sort of acid-base problem, which is most of them. Most disease states 
will result in some sort of hydrogen ion problem. But the problem with uh, when a patient arrives and an MD assesses, there's hydrogen ion, there's CO2, and there's bicarb, and they're all amok, okay? So the, the key to these tools is, to, I'm gonna show you three of them. Two of them are a little more practical, and one of them is uh, a tool that was developed for MDs to try to keep track of the three. Um, and you can use whatever tool you're comfortable with as long as you promise to use the tool appropriately because the CO2 hydrogen ion equation seems to be the most, e the, most uh, the easiest one, the one that we've been shifting back and forth, but that one has rules to it if you're gonna use it, okay? So let's lay out these tools and then we'll try to solve some hydrogen ion problems. So the, pro the issues with every one of these tools is how are we gonna keep track of three variables uh, at the same time? So. Essentially, that's what these tools are going to try to help us with. So we're going to try to keep track of three variables at the same time. So we've already been messing with one tool a little bit. We started in the respiration section. So very helpful tool because this tool, <coughs> once we add to this tool our buffer pool, it can help us keep track of all three variables as well as all three methods of trying to solve a problem. So if we think about our buffer pool as, as one, right, then we, let's talk, let's think about this buffer pool as our protein buffers, let's say can bind a hydrogen ion and make, and hide that hydrogen ion, oops. So if we add that equation to the existing equation, then we can see, we can use this tool to show us how buffers might help with the problem. We can use this tool to see how our lungs might help fix this problem they're represented here and then we can use this tool to try to see how the kidney might be able to help with this problem okay so it's a tool that shows us all three variables and then if we can see all three variables we can try to see how each of our tools will help us with this problem okay second tool the infamous Henderson Hasselbach equation So we're going to dig way deep back into first and second year. It's a scary place, I know, but we're not going to we're not going to belabor it too long. But it is it does help. Some people get right zen with this tool. If you remember, the Henderson Hasselbalch equation was relating pH to CO2 and bicarb. So pH, so the equation was 6.1 plus a log of ratio of the concentration of bicarb and the concentration of CO2. Okay, so we can start to see already all of our variables or most of our variables. The numerator here is gonna, under normal conditions, is gonna be 24 millimolar. The concentration of CO2 is not something that we've been talking about a lot. Okay, the concentration of CO2 is actually 1.2 millimolar, but that's really not the PO2 that we've been talking about, okay? So if we want to relate this to PO2, then we have to change things up a little bit. So we would just substitute in how we get to PO2 from concentration. We really just have a solubility constant ends of CO2 in solution, and then we can substitute that into, as PCO2 into the denominator, right? So now the numbers, this is uh, 24 millimolar. Our PCO2 under normal conditions was 40 millimolar, millimeters of mercury. 
A was the solubility constant of CO2 in solution, so in that plasma. So this A is the solubility constant. Uh, the solubility constant for CO2 is approximately 0 0.03. So if we want to use this as a tool, as you know, <coughs> we always put up equations and <coughs> never solve them, but use equations to see relationships, right? So if we want to see relationships, then we can get rid of a lot of stuff that here that doesn't matter, like who cares about 6.1. The solubility constant will stay constant, so whatever, uh, log, that's just a weird thing to do to numbers. So at the end of the day, you end up with a relationship between that pH is related to what the uh, concentration of bicarb is at any time and what our PCO2 is. Okay, so you can start to see the three, the three variables that we're going to be thinking about. And then this one doesn't have a representation of what our buffer pool is doing. Right, so if we wanted to think about how we were going to fix this problem, we would have to think about the buffer pool a little bit separately, but we can get an indication of what our kidney may need to do to fix a problem and what our lung may need to do to fix a pH problem. Okay, so these also kind of help you out a little bit. All right, so the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the carbonic acid equation, all helpful. Then the third one is going to take us a little bit to go through. It's probably not a tool that you're going to use like on an exam or when you're trying to figure out an acid-base problem, but it's really helpful in discerning, in seeing all the three variables move at the same time. Okay, so that's these are really good exercises to help you see what the problem is. So, and this is the Davenport diagram. invented by an MD, Horace Davenport. So, under normal conditions, uh, if we think about what our normal conditions are, we have a pH uh, 6.1 plus log um, of a ratio of bicarb to our partial pressure of CO2, this is 24, that's 40 millimeters of mercury. That was our solubility constant that you end up under these conditions with a pH of 7.4, okay? So that's our normal homeostatic conditions. Our body is happy with those relationships, okay? So now, though, What if we hold one variable constant, change another variable, and watch what happens to pH? Okay, so that's the game afoot. We're going to hold one variable constant. We're going to hold um, CO2 constant, change bicarb, and watch what happens to pH. And then we're going to do the opposite. We're going to hold bicarb constant. Uh, yeah, hold bicarb constant, change CO2, and watch this what happens. Watch what happens with pH. So the Davenport diagram is going to build this grid of relationships that can exist. Okay, so let's do that first bit. Let's hold. Let's hold CO2 constant and change. Our bicarb, then calculate then calculate pH. Okay. So what he did was he had a relationship where he was looking at pH and uh, the relationship to bicarb in terms of the concentration. Okay, and if we were to actually graph our normal, that was 7.4 and a pH of 20, or a, at a bicarb of 24, so that sits us here. Okay, so that's our normal pH bicarb relationship 
at a PCO2 uh, of 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay? So that's really just a graphical representation of the equation we did above. That's just translating that information to here. Okay? So let's keep PCO2 constant. and add bicarb. Okay. So if we were to add bicarb, right, we would fully expect, so we're going to add bicarb, so we're going to go up, right, we're going to get ourselves into a base excess situation, right, so we got to go up. Well, what's that going to do to hydrogen ion? You're going to bind more hydrogen ion, less free hydrogen ion, right, so pH will go up. So that's what would happen at a constant CO2 with adding more bicarb. And the opposite is also true with a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. And we were to remove bicarb. Okay. So if we were to remove bicarb, that puts us down on this axis, right? So it's got to come down. But what would happen with pH? Right? If we have less bicarb in the system, we're going to have more free hydrogen ion because we have less buffer, right? So it's got to be there. Right? So this, this has to exist. Okay? So you've got this relationship of what happens to pH at a constant CO2 when you mess with bicarb. So this, what he called an isobar, a PCO uh, was an isobar at, at a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. These relationships exist. Okay? So if we were to then do the same thing by, by saying, okay, well, let's change CO2. So let's just say, let's just jack CO2 up. So if we were to raise CO2, we know that th that would increase hydro free hydrogen ion, and pH would drop. Okay, if we have if we raise our bicarb, or sorry, our PCO2, we have a relationship that starts here. And then if we were to add, so remember, why bicarb just went up. Okay, so why did bicarb just go up when we increase CO2? If I increase CO2, I shift the equation to more hydrogen ion. That made sense, right? But I also have more bicarb, right? I split carbonic acid into bicarb and hydrogen ion. So not only did free hydrogen ion go up, pH went down. Bicarb also went up. We shifted forms, okay? So we have to live here. We have to live in a scenario if we're going to increase CO2, we are going to increase our bicarb because we shifted forms, and we're going to increase our hydrogen ion because we pushed the equation in that direction. So that has to exist. And now, if we take uh, bicarb out, so if we add bicarb or remove bicarb, we're going to get the same relationship. Okay. Similarly, if we were to drop PCO2, uh, let's go 20. Ah, my pen. That must mean the lecture's over when the pen runs out. If we're to drop PCO2, so PCO2 goes down, the equation gets pulled towards PCO2, right? So bicarb should drop because it's now in the form of carbonic acid. So we've got to go down. And we're going to have less free hydrogen ion because it's also in the form of carbonic acid. It's got to be here. PH will go up, right? That has to exist. And then if we were to move bicarb, if we were to take bicarb out or add bicarb, base excess, base deficit, we get ourselves there. Okay, so those are the only relationships that can exist, right, based on this calculation. We can't exist outside the isobars, okay? All right, we're going to add a whole bunch of more bars to this on Friday, so we'll see you then.